Welcome to our panel discussion number four, um, Gaze and Place, the Act of Travel and the Invention of Destinations. My name is Emmanuel Ortega. I am a visiting assistant professor at the University of Illinois at, um, at Chicago. And I just wanna welcome everybody. Um, thank you for participating. Thank you to our organizers, Arquetopia. Um, thank you, Tonali. Thank you, Francisco. Thank you, Nayeli, for all of your work and for offering this space for all of us around the world. So that's, that's very exciting. I'm particularly excited about today's panel, given that it coincides with uh, research that I'm working on, so I can wait for the discussion. So before we start, I wanted to introduce our panelists, and this is with no particular order. Um, we have Rebecca Corey, um, and she's the director of Nafasi Art Space, a center for contemporary art in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, which supports an artist collective studio spaces, art workshops, artist residencies, exhibitions, and other public events providing a meeting point for intensive dialogue between artists and the public. She has curated several group and solo exhibitions in Tanzania and organizes monthly interactive public art workshops and concerts. She's the co-director and producer of a feature documentary film called Wahenga, The Ancestors. Thank you very much and welcome, Corey, Rebecca, sorry. Um, next, we have Karim Katan. He's a writer and researcher who lives in Bethlehem, um, um, and Paris and Paris. In 2014, he co founded El Atlal, an international residency in Jericho <clears throat> for artists and writers. His first collection of short stories, and I'm going to give you the um, English translation Preliminaries for a Future Orchard, was published in 2017 by Elizad. His fictions and nonfiction works both in French and English, have been featured in a number of reviews and magazines and art venues. Welcome, Karim. Then we have Mary Sherman. <clears throat> she is an artist and director of the artist-run Transcultural Exchange, which she founded in Chicago in 1989. Hey! Um, she also teaches at Boston College and Northeastern University, and in 2010 served as the Interim Associate Director of MIT's Program in Art, Culture, and Technology. Additionally, for two decades, while pursuing her career as an artist, she worked as an art critic for such publications, such as the Chicago Sun-Times, the Boston Globe, and Art News. She has received numerous grants and awards, including three Fulbright Senior Speciali Specialist Grants, and been an artist in residence in such institutions such as MIT um, and Taipei Artist Village. Welcome, Mary. And, um, last but not least, we have Ryan and Lance, um, Ryan Elizabeth Reed and Lance Smith from Rogers Arts Loft. Ryan is a multidisciplinary artist and arts manager. She's a co-founder of Sprout Classes, intergenerational art and performance workshops for elders and teens. <clears throat> She's the founder and director of of Rogers Art Loft. Her practice expands to visual and performing arts, playwright, dance, choreography, and directing. Ryan is a member of Anne Halperin's Performance Lab, in which she has been choreographing or performing at David's Ireland Museum, Minnesota Street Project, Nexus Gallery, and the Young Museum. Welcome, Ryan. And then we have Lance Smith, a multidisciplinary artist, illustrator, and teacher based in Las Vegas. Their work often explores of loss, distortion, and liberatory practices. Smith is the artist manager of the Rogers Arts Loft and has been featured in multiple and local national group exhibits, as well as solo exhibitions past and forthcoming. Smith has been awarded <clears throat> two residencies at Arquetopia um, and also been part most recently of their mentorship program in Puebla, Mexico. They have received art programming, taught classes, and facilitated workshops aimed at extending creative activity beyond the formal artistic community in Las Vegas and in Puebla, Mexico. Smith emphasizes the importance of acknowledging one's institution as a tool for artistic expression. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to this wonderful panel. I'm looking forward to a fantastic dialogue. And today we're going to talk about a theme that has been present throughout the different um, discussions of, of this symposium, which is the idea of place. And as noted in the description, 
Place is a verb rather than a noun. It's a resource and a symbol, an instrument of power that naturalizes a cultural and social construction. And it is always contingent to gaze. Several examples associated with place have been ideologically invented through history, including nature, landscape, and geography. In her famous essay, The Imaginary Orient, Linda Nocklin explains that all colonial and touristic presences are dependent on their apparent absences, while also bringing into existence the notion of place through their um, controlling gazes. This is how places are invented. Quote, a world of timeless, atemporal customs and rituals untouched by the historical processes, end of quote. In that sense, artists' residencies become mediators of history and place and are constantly being forced to negotiate with the art world while being challenged by their own local context. And I want to pose right here, um, I want to pose the, um, the example of Van Humboldt so I wanted to pose the following example of Mexico as place as invented by the Prussian scientist Alexander van Humboldt. In the essay's view of the Cordilleras and Monuments of the Indigenous Peoples of America, published in 1810, Humboldt's definition of transversing the land with coalesce artistic, scientific, and political intentions had repercussions in the articulation of Mexico as an enterprise destination. In other words, Mexico as place. To encounter unknown and mythical regions of the Americas denoted a sense of exploration that Humboldt clearly delineated in his writings. Quote, I will consider my goal fulfilled if the humble sketches in this book inspire travelers with a passion for art to visit the regions that I transverse in order to depict faithfully these majestic sites. The romantic sensibilities of the beautiful, sublime, and picturesque frame each work presented in his personal writings for the early 19th century. It is no coincidence that in Mexico, the sites of Cholula and Xochicalco were later visited and consequently sketched by many artists in the, throughout the 19th century. The print titled Cholula, also from Cordilleras, and created by Wilhelm Melling, is perhaps the most romantic image of the publication. In this image, we see a vast picturesque landscape that opens in the foreground with a curious groups of, group of three people at the bottom right. We see two men standing as in lively conversation. They work together to make the landscape in front of them legible and subject to reason for the enlightened learning, learned circles of their time. As we move outwards towards the middle ground, the composition unveils a group of local hoarding cattle recalling the conventions of Georgic landscape one that celebrated the beauty of the countryside and simultaneously exalted the morality of physical labor. A rendition of the, rendition of the Temple of Cholula dominates the middle of the composition, which is framed with a majestic view of El Nevado de Orizaba. Local flora, including maguey and dragos, pleasantly sprout throughout the foreground to establish a picturesque setting for the characters. Among the protagonists, the anachronistic rendition of a classic female muse creates a particularly interesting dialogue, one that transformed Cholula into an idyllic landscape. Now the following question, why was it necessary to alter the local landscape to appear more European and pastoral? The insertion of classical language in the definition of his conceptions of indigenous past aimed to accomplish what hundreds of explorers and travelers did before him which is to render the universality of their approach familiar to readers abroad. The insertion of a classic female nude attests to a nostalgia for a lost past that without her presence becomes mysterious, unknown, and unwelcoming to foreign gaze. The allure must remain familiar to encourage others to follow. In Humboldt's writings and art, native peoples were rendered as quote unquote encounter fauna, practical only for their knowledge of the region. Native peoples, almost invisible, were the conduit that will allow enlightened travelers to find universal truths in a landscape that was never fully tamed in previous colonial inventions, interventions, excuse me. In other words, or in the words of French philosopher Bruno Latour, quote, the implicit geography of the natives is made explicit by geographers. 
the local knowledge of the savages becomes the universal knowledge of the cartographers, end of quote. Understanding geography here as the experience surveyed and transverse, that is journeyed terrain, we must recognize how there existed a need and there exists a need to transform local native knowledge of the land into universal ontological and scientific truths, and I say truths in quotations. The impulse to render belief systems into quantifiable knowledge should be comprehended as a colonial violence of serving spaces into consumable places. All affirmation dynamics were dependent in establishing ideological and racial differences between native peoples and European travelers and readers. The undermining of indigenous technologies and their subjectivity is a strategy which in the visual culture of exploration, discovery, and invasion is reducible down to fantasies of space and time. Understanding the transformation of the spaces in which artists' residencies are situated um, and they were distorted into places due to this type of historic colonial and neo-colonial practices, we post the following questions. What happens when an artist engages with artistic processes while immersed in a community where its culture, people, and even the place itself have been imagined and reimagined by art history, and in general, the dominant visual culture? Also, how is the history of the place where you or your organization are located intersecting with the challenges you face? And finally, how is your community challenging dominant narratives of the act of traveling? So with that in mind, I pass the microphone to um, Karim. We'll start, with, we'll start with you and I see. And again, just a quick reminder that we have approximately 10 minutes per presentation, and we'll come back to these questions at the end of all the presentations. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Emmanuel, for your presentation. And thank you, Architopia team, for hosting us um, here today. I'm really excited about this uh, conversation. Um, Actually, as I was listening to Emmanuel, I was like, maybe I should change my whole presentation and just do a slide-by-slide -slide comparison of what Emmanuel presented with what happens in Palestine because it's so strikingly similar. Um, it's always surprising how strikingly similar it is. Um, so just to present myself first, my name is Karim Katan. So I'm the one of the co-founders of a residency space in uh, Jericho, Palestine. So Jericho is an oasis located in the West Bank. And I'm also a writer, and I just finished my doctoral um, dissertation about the invention of the desert in French, in well, in novels in French, English, and Arabic uh, in the 19th and 20th century. Beyond that, as a Palestinian, um, I'm particularly sensitive to the way that thing that we call a uh, landscape, uh, which is a grid or a tool or a way of seeing is constructed throughout time um, by cultural productions, especially, and how studying these productions can unearth different ways of relating to a uh, place. And Palestine especially has been for centuries the focus of imperialist desires, of course, and imperialist imaginations. And I really mean for centuries, right? So there's been, I mean, you know, there's been the Roman Empire, the Ottoman Empire, and currently the Israeli settler colonial state. So it's, it stretches throughout the centuries. And Palestine is also a place of um, deeply ingrained cosmopolitanism, I think I'd say that, uh, especially as an important religious center for at least three main world religions. Um, and as such, it's always a good blueprint, I find, or uh, a place that can complicate how destinations are created, how destinations are sustained through time. And I think like in many ways, Palestine can be a sort of uh, prototype for the way uh, destinations are constructed. So my presentation is just, uh, this is an occupational hazard. So it's just like questions posed actually that I ask myself um, in Palestine, both as a person who works in a residency and as a writer. 
Um, and I wanted to start actually with, well, not start, but to talk about, uh, to quote Mark Twain. So in um, 1869, Mark Twain published a travel book that's called An Innocent Abroad. And he basically relates his travels through Europe and through the Orient. It's with a group of American travelers uh, two years prior. It's a sort of American grand tour uh, in the Orient and Europe. And it's actually one of Twain's best-selling books and one of the best-selling books, uh, travel books of all time. And in his, with his like trademark humor, in uh, Mark Twain deconstructs the American sacred geography in many ways. And he shows how the pilgrims travel not to see a place, but to verify and experience the landscape of the Bible as they expect it and imagine it to be in Palestine. And he satirizes this. And towards the end of the book, I'd just like to read a short quote uh, that's located at the end of the book after he's made fun for 300 pages of the pilgrims. <clears throat> and Mark Twain did not enjoy his time in Palestine. So the quote. Of all the lands there are for dismal scenery, I think Palestine must be the prince. The hills are barren, they are dull of color, they are unpicturesque in shape. It is a hopeless, dreary, heartbroken land. And then he starts comparing the places as he expected them and as he found them. So he compares a lot of places and he gets to Jerusalem. Renowned Jerusalem itself, the stateliest name in history, has lost all its ancient grandeur and has become a pauper village. The riches of Solomon are no longer there to compel the admiration of visiting Oriental queens, blah, blah, blah. Uh, Palestine is no more of this workday world. It is sacred to poetry and tradition. It is dreamland. And he basically establishes a contrast between what he expected and what he saw, between the cultural, so to speak, and the real. And it's I actually chose this quote as well because it's striking the way he uses the, he uses the prefix un- to really emphasize the stark difference between what he expected and what he actually saw. And I actually like, so he says, unlovely and unpicturesque, which is a word I actually like because I've learned in Mexico that the picturesque uh, is an adjective that was also used in many ways in Mexico, at Mexico rather, so self-relevant. So although this is taken in the specific history of American colonial expansionism, I, I, I feel that the way Twain deconstructs the myth of travel can be applied to many places, including Palestine today. So until today, people who come to Palestine, and by people I mean both tourists, pilgrims, or cultural practitioners of all kinds and activists. So when, when people come to Palestine today, they're still looking for narratives, whether they're biblical or political. Uh, what I've noticed time and time again, both in the residency and just as an, you know, an active writer here, is that foreigners come to Palestine very often to enact a fantasy. Um, and very often they already know what they want to see when they come to Palestine. I, I, and this is one of the things that interested me most. They know what to expect. And a bit like Twain, they come with a series of adjectives about Palestine that they just want to confirm or verify. Uh, so I actually, uh, that's why I, I like this thing with the suffix where he says unlovely, unpicturesque. I think like for instance, they're gonna they're gonna come and expect Palestine to be a spiritual, right? And then they'll notice that Palestine is unspiritual. Like it's always in the negative. <clears throat> um, and I think everyone, at least in the Western world, has an image of what Palestine is or what they think Palestine is or should be. Um, and I think like, in many ways we can say that Palestine, and by Palestine, I don't mean the real place, but the um the placeholder or the name holder for Palestine um, was invented by photographers and painters and writers from Europe and the USA in the 19th century. So we live in an invented place in many ways. Like it's undeniable. Um, I don't do. I tend to not do presentations, so I, well, I won't show you any examples. But actually, a lot of them are point by point exactly this, the type of images that Emmanuel showed us. You just substitute a few things and it's the, the same production. Um, and usually in, the, in these photographs and in these um, paintings, etc., what we see is a sort of empty landscape 
with a few peasants and dressed in you know traditional or what they think is traditional Palestinian garb, uh, and a few people who are always made to look like biblical figures. And many of the photographers and the the painters who came came to find this sort of pure biblical population that would still exist in Palestine. <clears throat> I'm nearly done. I know I have two minutes left. Um, I, I just wanted to insist on uh, talk about this because this invention is neither innocent nor is it without consequence. Um, it's not only a cultural production that's not attached to a real place that has uh, real consequences, because in many ways, this in invention, in the case of Palestine, is at the basis of the Israeli settler colonial agenda, right? The, the creation of Israel itself in 1948 is propped, among other things, on the false assertion that the Israelis found a place without a people for a people without a place, right? Or that they made the desert bloom, which is always fascinating to me because there's very little desert in Palestine. It's actually a place of you know rolling green hills. And yet, in everyone's imagination, mine included, the desert takes a big place in Palestine. Um, people come here expecting to experience a desert, a type of desert or, or a type of wilderness, and they're very disappointed when they don't. How long do I, I just have a minute, I'm rushed. Um, so, be, so basically, I'm gonna skip a lot of things, but one of the things I wanted to get to was that in my experience as a Palestinian, as a writer and in, the, in our uh, residency space, uh, there are many ways to challenge these myths of destination um, and Palestine itself as a civil society, as a cult, but also as a disappearing occupied landscape, just by the sheer fact that it exists as a landscape that is currently disappearing, can, always, can provide a framework for challenging these myths of destination. Palestine asks the question to all of us that it that asks us questions that would be interesting to struggle with. Because when you go to a disappearing occupied landscape like Palestine, where do you go to actually when you go to Palestine? What do you look for there in a place that is misconstrued often as one of, like, you know, it's misconstrued at, as the cradle of Western civilization? So, what do you look for when you go there? And what can you find in Palestine, especially in the framework of residencies, that can create an element of surprise, an element of unexpected, unexpectedness in the encounter with Palestinian land? I'm going to stop here. I had a few other things, but I'll talk about them later because I don't want to take too much time. But uh, yeah, so I'm going to stop here, if that's fine. Thank you so much, um, Karim. I think the... The idea of the picturesque is very interesting and important, especially because um, within the conventions of landscape, the picturesque always contains small, small people that are never fully visible in landscape and paintings and photographs. So it is the job of the tourists to amplify that, but that amplification require um, previous um, previous fantasies. And I particularly love your question of how do we challenge these myths, which is something that we should come back to um, again. So speaking of deserts, let's go now to Vegas. <laughs> Why don't we um, talk with Ryan and Lance so, so we can continue this theme of, of deserts around or um, imagine deserts around the world. Thank you, Emmanuel. Um, Lance and I um, prepared this together. And um, again, thank you for this because it led to a lot of really interesting conversations between the two of us. Absolutely. Um, we will together present about um, the residency itself and then I'll present about a few topics and then Lance well. Um, so before you start, Ryan, just considering that it's two of you, you can take um, 15 minutes or even a little bit more. Okay, together. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I'll start the presentation when you're ready, let me know. Okay. Um, so Rogers Art Loft is actually a pretty young organization. Um, we're in our, we're just accepting our second round of applications and um, it's allowed us to be, um, to think really broadly about 
what we want to provide for artists, um, what kind of space we want to provide. Um, and it's also allowed us to be nimble um, this in this first um, period of the program. Um, just a little bit about the residency. Um, we accept multidisciplinary artists. Um, we just had our first international artist last month. Um, and we are based in downtown Las Vegas. Um, and um, we also, one, one thing that this brought up for us um, is that we, because of um, our benefactors and um, the community, there's a lot of interest in um, public and outward facing events by the artists. And um, we do spend a lot of time and resources to create that engagement with the community. Um, Lance, is there anything you want to add about? Our yeah, program? absolutely. You know, um, we are a very young program, but uh, uh, to Ryan's point, we do move it a lot. And specifically with uh, this uh, pandemic, we've had to pivot even more. Uh, but, you know, the Rogers Art Loft, we welcome artists for two to eight weeks in downtown Las Vegas. Uh, and our main mission is just inclusivity, originality, and, you know, creating a space that functions so the artists can get the work done they need to in the, uh, in Las Vegas, you know, in the, uh, the space that is Las Vegas. Yeah, I think it's also important to note um, that both Lance and I are practicing artists and we really bring that to the program. Um, and I think it changes the discussions that we have in working together and also with the artists. Um, and that's something we're always talking about as well. Um, these are some of the, the artists in residence previously. Um, you know, the, the work that they created during the residency really ranged. Um, performance, sculpture, social art, fiber arts, um, work around precarity. Um, so. Yeah, and so we uh, found uh, it interesting having a very degree of artists uh, that each of them show up differently. And going back to Ryan's point, uh, us both being practicing artists really allowed us to be able to show up in a way that really uh, helps facilitate uh, the artists as soon as they get there, you know what I mean? And it's just been really beautiful to watch the, the varied approaches that each of these artists have uh, to their practices. And the core thing uh, with Rogers Art Loft is that community, you know? Uh, we, me and Ryan both work uh, in community where it's you know, bringing together the elderly and uh, teens, but like the community connection is like, kind of the one of the, like the lifeblood of the the residency and I think that is part of the reason why we've been able to pivot in a way that still allows us to be as impactful. We also wanted to talk just briefly about um, how we're responding right now to the pandemic um, and how we've transitioned. Um, we did have two artists in residence, two dancers, um, when there was the shelter in place order here in the US, uh, specifically in Nevada. Um, and those artists returned, we got them home safely. Um, and we, we ended up postponing two residencies and pulled back and um, eventually decided to pivot to a virtual format um, until we'll be able to go back in person. And so our first um, virtual artist was last month. Um, her name's Gemma Marmalade, she's from the UK. Um, and she did a piece um, around the voice and, um, you know, like kind of the Alexa. Um, and um, she asked, callers from anywhere in the world to call in and talk with her about worries they had related to the pandemic um, or or other other things they wanted to talk about and 
um, her character was very much an AI. So you weren't sure if you were speaking with um, a human or AI. A lot of feedback was confusion around that. Um, and there, she created a, a short video. We thought we'd share a little bit so you get a sense of the voice um, for this piece. Thank you for your call. We'll be connected to Voda shortly. You can speak to Voda about anything on your mind. You can ask questions or make statements. Voda will engage you in conversation. You or Voda can terminate the call at any point. You are welcome to call back to experience Voda again. All calls are free of charge for US and UK callers and are recorded for training and monitoring purposes. Your conversation will not be shared with any third parties without your express permission. Connecting you to Voda. So that's a little taste of what it was like to call her, although um, she did engage with the callers. So there was um, a discussion and most of her responses she took from speech acts um, and, um, so she was trying to use language that she had sourced from another place and responding like from previous pandemics and things like that, um, to respond to callers. And it was really interesting to hear from her about how people responded, um, when they called in, um, she had a tarot reading by someone, um, she talked with a burger shop. Um, people shared a lot about worries related to the pandemic or employment, um, health. So yeah, that's um, Voda. Um, I just wanna, I, I wanna transition um, specifically, you know, away from RAL and to the, the location where our residency is, which is Las Vegas. Um, and there's, there's so much um, ritual in Las Vegas. And I thought that was an interesting um, element to talk about, you know, uh, a really common ritual that first comes to my mind is, is marriage. Um, and that is, if you've heard about in Las Vegas, you know, something that, that can be provided to you quickly um and maybe in um have all the elements of the ceremony um like the drive through um marriage or things like that um i also was thinking about flying to las vegas and it feels like there's even a bit of a ritual around that um like flight attendants say different things over the intercom related to where you're headed there's more drinking on the plane, I notice, um, celebrating bachelor party, bachelorette parties, things like that. Um, and then the, the marketing and, uh, and arrival into the airport. Um, and um, the slogan is, is often there when you arrive, which is what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Um, and that with to what Kareem was talking about earlier, the the idea of um, what did you say, going to a place to enact a fantasy, that is that is exactly um, Las Vegas, um, and and also the the kind of the ritual of arriving if you're staying in a hotel, um, the whole process and and feeling of that, um, and I put this quote. Um, by one of my mentors um, about ritual and performance, which I'll talk a bit more about performance later. Um, it's by Anna Halperin. Um, in part by rewriting the role of the spectator, making her a witness, an individual who is present at the performance to support it with her attention, rather than looking to it for diversion or entertainment, 
my ambition is to change individuals present at the performance, um, which I think also speaks to this, this theme of gaze. Um, and I also um, wanted to note another ritual, which is um, the, the ritual of cards and the, the card dealers and the, all the casino, the games, the ritual of, of all of that. Um, Um, so our first artist in residence, Ayanna Moore, um, created this work for Queens, which was a series of prints for prints, um, which, you know, as you can see from this one image subverts the white king queen dominant, um, dominant on all deck of cards that I had seen previously. Um, and Addition, I was researching a bit more about um, cards themselves, and they're very much a symbol um, historically of class, of colonialism, um, and have come to be considered by some a historical document because they were previously used to send letters and important notes. Um, so I think, you know, Ayana's work is obviously directly linked to the, the deck of cards and um, is a reinvention of them, um, including the female body and, and black women uh, into the deck of cards. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, I, that's all I have. And Lance, I'll turn it over to you. Hey everyone, hi, how are you? Um, you know, I'm, again, I just want to just make it uh, abundantly clear that I'm very thankful to be here. Uh, I'm thankful to Paco, Nayeli, Tonali, everyone here right now, um, because this uh, time has really given me time to see things in a different way. Um, so I'll start off with place, Las Vegas Strip as place. Um, again, when we think of uh, Dr. Kirsten Buick, we talk about you know how space lives and place is dead. Um, space is actualized, place is described. Um, Las Vegas as the ultimate, one of the ultimate invented spaces. Um, again, place is a verb rather than a noun. It is a, a resource and a symbol and instrument of power that naturalizes a cultural and social construction. Uh, harking uh, back to uh, Kristen Buick's talk, uh, specifically about the Christian religious uh, creationist theme park, the Ark Encounter in Kentucky, I found some very eerily similar connections um, with Las Vegas. Um, when you think of uh, aestheticizing a land uh, and who has the access of aestheticizing the land, usually you have to be white and male. Or if you think of the Bellagio, um, it's literally uh, created from the fantasy of Steve Wynn going to Bellagio in Italy and being able to take that back. Um, so it's just interesting to think about the entire strip, you know, kind of this, uh, monument, multiple monuments erected in the desert in a climate that's not meant for us to be here, honestly. Uh, and being able to take us to all of these landmarks, if you will. Uh, and also I was thinking about tourism uh, as conquest, as small conquest. Uh, also, uh, I start to think about uh, the gaze, uh, how we are able to focus the gaze of tourism uh, through luxury and the, the problematic uh, idea of authenticity. Uh, when I think about uh, the authentic, having worked inside of a casino for five years, you see that the luxury is ran and the, the only way that that fantasy of luxury can actually happen is by the life force of mostly Latinx people and other minorities. Um, so that's just an interesting thing to think about uh, the way that uh, whether it's Bouchon, which is, you know, a restaurant that's hearkening to other regions, or it's just a spa. Again, like this luxury, this falsified luxury that people come to experience while all the while um, it is created by, uh, you know, minorities. Uh, also, I want to talk about uh, luxury and shopping and dining. Uh, akin to residencies uh, where we give a certain kind of luxury uh, to the people that come into our spaces, spaces, excuse me. Um, there's still always that imaginary 
uh, energy of the other that's making this thing happen. Uh, I also want to talk about monument. Uh, the quote from Dr. Kirsten Buick talks about uh, the work that these monuments, and this is in regards to you know, some of the American you know, Confederate monuments, but I was trying to bring it back to here. Uh, the work that these monuments participate in is to tell only the celebratory narratives of the Confederate generals, brutal doctors who experimented on captive populations, slave holdings, and openly racist founding fathers, and United States presidents, and a host of similarly problematic historical figures who were excused as men of their time, in quote, Dr. Uh, Kirsten Pye Buick. And the idea of monument, uh, uh, how the Las Vegas Strip has a very cis white herd and often other. When you think of the Luxor, um, uh, a creation, a recreation of the pyramids uh, in Egypt. But I really think about the way that you can control all the the blackness out of things, out of certain narratives, because again, uh, the Angloized features of the Sphinx. You know what I mean? Like all of those things that come through when you think about the predominant culture and their ability to actually create monument that is really the Las Vegas Strip is a highlight re real to the dominant culture, you know, the dominant white supremacist culture. Um, you know, and also I want to talk for a moment about how Las Vegas uh, destabilizes the flora and fauna. Uh, the Las Vegas Strip, uh, specifically the Luxor light, is one of the strongest lights in the world, and it creates its own ecosystem. Uh, lights that you can see from space, you can see from states over, just like the pure audacity of, uh, you know, the, the, of whiteness to be able to erect these monuments and just kind of completely disrupt uh, the spaces. And uh, to end here, I just wanted to talk about how uh, Kareem talked about uh, Mark Twain going into these spaces and not getting exactly what they wanted uh, in some of these spaces. And I think that oftentimes happened with Vegas. It is a win or lose. You come to win, but you more than likely will lose. So it's like, like what is Las Vegas? It is one of the ultimate fantasies, but it you come with your inhibitions lowered, or, you know, low vibrational, and you sometimes come out a winner and then you sometimes come out losing a lot of things. So just you know, as the, you know, the danger of Las Vegas is also something that kind of came to mind. But yeah, uh, that's what I have. And thank you so much uh, for letting uh, me speak. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. Hopefully I didn't go over. No, too. perfectly oh. on time. Thank you so okay. much. Um, to both Ryan and Lance, this is fascinating. Because um, now we are entering different territories, right? With Karim, we talk about the picturesque. And uh, a good point that Ryan made is the material culture of um, that reflects the myth of place. Thinking about cards, right? So it's not just about the preconceived idea of arriving to the place and making that fantasy. You must have material culture to, to add to that fantasy and to what Lance is saying, it now also monuments. So the built environment. It's also aiding in the construction of these fantasies. And thinking about casinos as monuments of place just blew my brains away. You just couldn't see it because you were sharing your screen. Thank you, both of you, for, for the wonderful presentations. So let's now um, let's now talk about let's now talk first with Mary, and then we will finish with Rebecca. Again, no particular order. And Mary, take it away. Okay, I think it's off now. So, okay, so my uh, presentation is slightly different because uh, I'm the founder and director of Transcultural Exchange, which originated in Chicago. But our goal has never been a specific place. It has always been global. So that we try to get our artists not to think of themselves as American or this or that, but actually part of a large global community. So it's slightly different, but we have we come into, a, of course, many stereotypes and all kinds of things along the way as a consequence. So. Um, I'm just going to give a little bit of background about the organization so people can understand what we do, and then I'll just uh, address your issues. And I'm very interested in this uh, because um, issue about, as you were talking about earlier, about Mark Twain and this other issue about the Mexican example you gave. 
Um, the U.S., of course, did the same with the Park Service. So we can go back and talk about that, too, with man images of manifest destiny to get the East to go West, blah, blah, blah. So anyway, um, transcultural exchange mission is different. Uh, we have, we're, we're interested in fostering a greater, well, not different, but but in a, uh, or the way we do it is slightly different. Um, it's to foster greater understanding of world cultures through large-scale global art projects, close cultural exchanges, and educational programming. Probably what we're most well known for is our international conferences on opportunities in the arts, which was started in 2007. Initially, Transculture Exchange was a grassroots initiative created to produce a global exchange program. And that was between artists in Chicago and Vienna. And like all our subsequent projects, that exchange was multidisciplinary. The project included an exhibition, film screenings, music, and a literary program. Later projects included more artists and countries. And finally, in 2002, we produced our truly global, our first truly global project, which took place in 100 places throughout the world. It was called the Coasted Project, and we used the internet to solicit artists to produce 100 coaster-sized artworks, the small works. And instead of showing them in galleries or whatever, we would show them in cafes and bars. And so in three month period of time, we had 100 exhibits and 100 public spaces. They had to be in a public space. And then all those small artworks were tagged with the project and all those artworks were given away for free. So in three months time, we gave out 10,000 artworks to the public. And then you could go and you could find out more about your artists by going to the website and learning more about who they were. After that, we produced another project which we asked artists to donate tiles to 22 sites around the globe. And each person in that part of the world, we didn't want to dictate what they should do with the tiles. They created their own uh, artwork out of the tiles. Some created a mosaic, some created sculptures, some created um, various, various things. They created out of the tiles to suit their environment. So um, let's see. And then later we asked artists to participate. We're, we've done a number of projects, but uh, to collaborate with someone from another part of the world because we're trying to get them to think, you know, the world is global, even though may, they may live somewhere. So the idea was work to work with someone in another part of the world to create a collaborative work. You know, how do you do this? How do you manage it? We had about 60 projects that we ended up doing. And, and then we did another iteration of that, which was asking them to not only work with another artist, to work with someone in another discipline. So to think outside of the box in another kind of way. And then of course, there was Hello World. Um, so when that, all sorry you don't know what hello world is but there was the pandemic and then the pandemic caused us to think of hello world so i'm i'm really terrible about public speaking but so for hello world our idea was to take the many gestures of kindness that people were doing to provide solace to their neighbors such as the italian balcony singers and broadcast them on a global scale through hello world which is an online portal so hence, we put out a call for artists everywhere working in any discipline to provide us with a virtual sample of the work, a JPEG, a video, or a sound piece, for instance. We took all those works we received, and we made a web page for them. And then those web pages were groups. So let's say you were, you're interested in sound. So we grouped them into like little images. And so because we have 250 works that were given to us. It's a lot. No one wants to scan through 250 pages. So for instance, if you're interested in sound, you can see, you see a musician. So you think sound, you click there and you can see 10 sound pieces. Here is 10 sound pieces by artists in eight different countries. So th there's a cross-cultural element where you can see how different, like if you go to dance, we have a piece from France, we have a piece from Russia, we have a piece from Zambia, we have a couple pieces from the US. But anyway, you get the idea. You can start to see how different artists are working in different parts of the world. So um, let's see now, where am I? Uh, okay, so oh, and then the other thing we wanted to do with Hello World was we wanted to, sh to um, for all those venues now that are struggling, we wanted to help them. And we, and we know that they probably are also wanting to uh, support their colleagues. So we asked each artist to give us the name of a venue and we also solicited venues um, that wanted to take us stand of global solidarity with their colleagues around the globe and say, you know, we're all in this together. And so we created a list of venues with their websites who agreed to link Hello World to their website. So they gained instant cross-cultural programming and they helped us get the word out about Hello World and we gave them some extra visibility. 
So we're actually hoping to to do more with that, but that's where it's at now. And it's on the website and you can visit all these things. And then in 2002, we we uh, we had such so many artists wanting to do things, and we had we work on a very 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 limited budget with lots of volunteer work. So we realized we needed to incorporate. So at least we could apply for some grants. And so in 2002, we incorporated, and in 2007, we added an international conference on opportunities in the arts to what we do. These conferences bring hundreds of artists, well, two or 300 artists together with about 150 speakers who run programs around the globe for talks, for portfolio reviews, for them to learn about all the things that are going around in the world. The plan, it takes us about two to three years to do this because we need to get a lot of stuff together and a lot of people to help us. But as our post-conference surveys prove, new partnerships, partnerships and exchanges between the conference cities, institutions, and the participating international organizations happen, also with national ones. Um, so there's new ties, new residency um, exchanges are set up. Also, a high number of the artists who attend are, get invited to a residency, of course, because you know they want to go abroad. The people who come want them to go abroad or want them to go to their city. So um, they are they learn of other programs and they create new opportunities for themselves. And for it's actually helped us tremendously because instead of us producing a, a program every two years or so, like the Tile Project or Hello World, the artists started meeting each other and they started doing things themselves, which was wonderful. So that's become our chief activity because it has actually increased you know, what, our mission tremendously. Um, and then we also have one other thing because artists, you know, wanted to know about what, what they can do other places. You know, they see themselves like, you know, we're living in the 21st century. We see ourselves as part of a global community. So we, we have a um, resource listing on our website, which only lists resources. We curate them that are free to artists, are, are low cost, are, and if, if they cost, there's a good reason so that artists no longer have to comb all those various postings to find things that really interest them. And then in terms of your question, what happens to an artist that engages in an area that they had be, that before had been imagined or reimagined by art history? We have found, as you would imagine, that artists start to think more globally. They take an interest in other regions and they come back to communities with new knowledge and new art forms. We actually produced, have surveyed our artists and we have a document that's on our website for free, which is 10 years of surveying what happens when our artists go abroad or they participate in the conference. So we can back up what we all already know that good things happen when people interact with one another. It changes their mindset, right? Um, so we can, we can show also that they gain new, um, they, they gain new markets for their work. Some of them, if they have a show abroad, of course, this helps them at their university if they want to get academic promotions, all these kinds of things. So, um, and then, and so that's one thing I can say. And then in terms of the question about changing the dominant narrative, again, we have found that by getting people to deal with each other on a one-to-one -one basis, that many stereotypes assumption and assumptions are tested and adjusted. One of my favorites is, more American, I'm an American, <laughs> is when someone participated in a transcultural ex exchanges conference in Boston. He was from Europe. And I was happy when I heard him say to one of, that one of the most hopeful things he saw about the conference was that it was a chance to see a side of America that was other than the one he read about in the press. Here he saw a um, side of America which was open to new ideas, receptive to others, and desirous to work with their colleagues around the world. Not exactly what is the usual American message. Um, then this then is how we challenge and do challenge dominant narratives and use mobility to insert nuances into mediated concepts. In other words, we and others who do this kind of mobility work, like all of you, provide people with direct empirical, empirical encounters with others, people, and cultures, meaning we offer people the possibility to see, hear, taste, feel, to through your senses experience what they previously knew through texts they read, films they watched, or other historical documents. In this way then, just as researchers and scientists test and prove any assumption, people who travel to participate or participate in a mobility program are able to do the same. They have the tools to get their mind to readjust the assumptions they took on. So that was, that's what I have to say. So I hope this helps you want.
Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much, Mandy. I also um, want to thank all of you for putting this together. It's really wonderful. Thank you. And thank you for including me. So this is, um, you posed really interesting um, questions as well. Because when we think of ourselves or artists as global citizens, I wonder um, what kind of fantasies um, that destroys or that um, recreates. So we can come back. We can come back to, to some of those ideas. So now we're going to continue with um, Rebecca and, um, and, and then we'll, we'll begin our conversation. All right, hello everyone. Uh, thank you so much to Architopia um, for organizing this wonderful virtual symposium. Um, it's been an honor to be a part and, and I've already learned so much. Uh, my name is Rebecca Yonghye Corey. I'm uh, an Amer a South Korean American transplant to Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, um, where for the past four years I have served as the director of Nafasi Art Space, um, which is a multidisciplinary contemporary art center um, that uh, hosts a collective of artists working in um, studios um, and also has an international residency program, um, as well as a public program of events and exhibitions. Um, and so today, I would um, the the topic of um, this this panel uh, made me uh, encourage me inspired me to think about so many things, um, and so I just have uh, some photos, uh, pictures, and quotes to share with you. Um, and I think to position Dar es Salaam um, and Tanzania uh, in in context. Um, Dar es Salaam is on the, the coast of Tanzania, um, on the Indian Ocean, and gained political independence in 61, uh, and formed the union with, with the island Zanzibar in 64 to become Tanzania. Um, and Tanzania's uh, political history is one of, um, of fighting against imperialism, against capitalism, um, creating a, a form of homegrown African socialism known as Ujamaa, under the independence uh, leader and first um, first president Julius Nyerere, um, and and so it's it's with this backdrop of of being a place uh, that was a home um, to to independence um, fighters from around the continent and around the world um, that uh, that our art space our kind of humble art space um, evolved. And so rather than talking too much about Mufasi and, and saying the things that you guys could probably just find on the website. I want to talk about the unseen, um, maybe unstated uh, things, ideas, values um, that have, have helped us build this space um, as what we think of um, as an alternative to kind of the, the existing systems and structures of, of domination and control um, in, in the world at the moment. Um, so Nafasi art space. Nafasi is a Kiswahili word um, that means um, space or opportunity, chance. Um, so in this one word, it um, highlights the interconnectedness of the ideas of space, um, chance, opportunity, and possibility, all in one word. Um, and we exist to further and enrich human potential through contemporary art. Um, so uh, I, let me see. I want to talk about, um, you know, presenting some some images and ideas that I think go very much contrary to what people imagine when they think of Tanzania or Africa. And what so many of you already spoke, spoke about, um, you know, resonates so much um, in terms of, you know, this projection of, of what people imagine a place to be. Um, so a lot of people, when they think of, of Tanzania, they imagine um, exactly what this, uh, this, the, the kind of foreign white colonial gaze um, has invented um, this this fantasy, but I would I would posit that you know when we when we're using the word fantasy, you know another word that we could use is scam uh, or conspiracy, uh, because really the the impact of these uh, these creations um, has been to you know to silence, um, erase, suppress um, a lot of the truth of you know of what exists here, um, and so you know when when people think of, of, ten, of, of Africa, I think they're imagining a lot of the scenes um, of Tanzania and what people come here to experience as tourists, um, which is the, you know, the white beaches of Zanzibar or the plains of Serengeti, or, you know, that single um, acacia tree, uh, you know, in black with the, the burning red sunset behind it, um, which is the cover of pretty much every novel set in Africa that, that normally features a, 
you know, a white person finding themselves or the meaning of life uh, through their encounters um, with the, the African other. Um, but, you know, I don't want to talk too much about this because I think it falls into the trap that, that Toni Morrison spoke about, which is how the real function of racism is to force, um, force us to always be proving, you know, racism says you don't have a culture. And so you, you spend all your time trying to prove that you do um, in opposition to this, this reality that has been presented to you as the only truth. Um, so what is the alternative? Um, and I think, you know, Nafasi exists um, our residency program and our, our, our programs in general, um, hoping to be this kind of force that, that creates a space that could cause other people to be able to understand themselves or their own systems um, in relation to something other than, um, you know, this, this, uh, this kind of oppressive system of domination. Um, so, uh, so this photo is of a Zanzibari artist um, called Aida Abdallah in front of a textile piece that she installed um, as a part of an exhibition that we did called About Time um, in Stonetown that was a part of a special residency project that we organized there um, where each artist's site-specific piece was installed in a different public location, um, which is normally kind of a swarm of, of tourists um, and uh, a place where the kind of foreign gaze always threatens to overtake the reality of the place itself. Um, so it was an example of how through these you know, artistic interventions, um, you can kind of force a, a re, um, refocusing of, of this gaze um, and insist on your own presence um, in, in, in this location, in the space. Um, so the next few slides are um, of, of the excavation sites um, of Tendaguru, which um, is a place where in 1906, a German uh, colonialist um, quote unquote discovered, uh, discovered these, these dinosaur fossils. Um, and between 1909 and 1913, excavated more than 225 tons of dinosaur bones, um, making it one of the product most productive fossil sites in all of Africa to this very day. Um, and one thing, uh, you know, when I, I thought, when I heard about this and I was reading doing research about this and finding out about this, you know, in all of the blogs and articles that you can find online on the Smithsonian website, um, National Geographic, uh, not a single one mentions that, uh, mentions colonialism, mentions that these, these dinosaur bones were stolen or looted from their original location in this context. Um, and that now, you know, they're considered natural history and the, the inheritance of all of humankind while they sit in, in, a, in a museum in Berlin where they're really only accessible to the descendants, mainly accessible to the descendants of the people who colonized um, the land itself. Um, and, you know, so when you read these, these articles, you hear about the hardship endured by the people who were, who were making this, this great uh, world-changing scientific discovery, but so little about uh, you know that what actually was happening um, to the people, the the people local to that that space. Um, and now you know it continues to this day with um, you know the people mainly focusing on the the conservation of um, of ruins or of elephant populations or lion populations um, without thinking about you know in while erasing the, the human communities that lived around them. Um, and Susan Sontag in one of her um, essays on photography talked about how, you know, really people have just replaced the, the gun of the safari with, with the camera. And when you go on a, a safari in the Serengeti, you see the camera of the tourist being wielded very much as a weapon. Um, so, so this is uh, this very old picture of, of one of the dinosaurs of Tindaguru. Um, and now, you know, there are all of these conversations being held about the artistic uh, objects um, that are held in museums around the world um, and the continued kind of conversations about them being returned. So, um, you know, in Tanzania, where we have a very kind of, uh, very little infrastructure when it comes to, to art, uh, very small collections in museums of, of Tanzanian art, um, it's so important to remember the, that these absences, um, you know, have, have been created through very intentional processes. Um, so a Kiswahili proverb that um, 
I think really speaks to this is ukimwa nchindong kubwa, which means silence, uh, silence makes a big explosion or silence is loud. Um, and, and so to also just connect this with some of the, the human stories um, that have happened here in Tanzania that are so, that are little known, um, are the stories of resistance to, to, to colonialism um, as fought by the Hehe chief in Kwawa, um, Mangimeli in the 1890s in northern Tanzania, um, the Maji Maji uprising. And so these, uh, you know, this history of resistance has really been um, almost completely you know, erased from, from the story. So when you have these uh, tourists and, uh, you know, people coming to Tanzania who, who know very little about this history um, because it has been so, so silenced. Um, so, you know, it's, it's with these, these silences and absences in mind um, that, you know, Nafasi, we, we, our goal is really to uh, do what the, the Kenyan writer said, um, to fight for the liberation of the economy, politics, culture, and psyche of a people um, by liberating their capacity to make and name their world and empower the least among us. Um, so the Nafasi concept is that Tanzanian artists um, get the chance to work in the space um, create exchange um, and build uh, build kind of a, a center of gravity from which they can they can stand and, and really take a position. So uh, at the beginning, I kind of titled what I wanted to my remarks about um, taking a position. Um, and it's you know in order to take a position, you have to it, it helps to have you know kind of some solid ground to stand on. Um, and so I just wanted to share a few pictures of our space, um, which is uh, on a big kind of in, in the industrial part of town, surrounded by warehouses and factories, um, and converted into this art space using uh, shipping, recycled shipping containers. Um, and so I think it's for us, it's very important that when we invite uh, artists from other places into, into our space, um, that it has, it's very much um, about enforcing and reinforcing, reiterating um, kind of the equal dignity um, of the visiting artists uh, with the community that's welcoming them in. Um, so another uh, proverb that I really uh, like is Ukitaka kufaham utamu wangoma ngia ucheze, which means if you want to understand the beauty of the, of the music, um, you have to enter it and dance. Um, and so we really, uh, again, I'll use this word, insist, we insist and encourage um, the, our visiting artists um, that if they want to be a part of, um, you know, of our residency program, um, that they have, to, they have to enter it. You can't be the spectator uh, with, with, you know, only kind of um, reinforcing the, 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 the gaze, um, but actually entering and participating um, in that which we are creating or attempting to create in the space. Um, and so that, you know, that's in the form of, of immersive um, performances and exhibitions. Um, and these are just some of the artists that we work with. Um, so Isaac Abaneko, who did a, um, a performance, uh, a performance um, and research that was looking at the influence of African masks in contemporary life. Um, Rebecca, you um, just want to wrap it up. Yeah, but we can come back to some of okay. this. Yeah. Well, I'll just quickly um, show some of these images um, with the different uh, work that, that the artists have created. Um, and so ultimately, um, that, uh, that, you know, from a position of, of kind of generosity, we hope to welcome people into the space, but also, um, you know, kind of, demand a recognition of this kind of hidden and silenced history um, that, that underlies the place that we inhabit. Thank you so, so much. You post, an, um, I think, an incredibly important point, which is the, the creation of this spaces as places is contingent to the silences they create. This fantasies erase labor, this fantasies erase, which um, for me is very important, native resistance. So thank you, thank you for that. So with that in mind, um, thinking about this idea of how we challenge these myths, 
I wondered if we could um, we could talk a little bit about that because thinking about all of the presentations together, it makes me think of the role of the artist. So if the artist, it, it, the idea of these residencies is to have the artist challenge this myth by way of creating material culture and the way they interact with the built environment, which is all, it's all inscribed with um, in their minds, perhaps with these fantasies, how as directors, how as artists, um, are we challenging that? And I op um, and I open the 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 floor for everybody, including our gracious host, if they want to intervene as well, um, and, uh, about answering some of these questions. So I don't know if somebody wants to to start with the idea of challenging this um, this historical and 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 scam conspiracy <laughs> uh, myths that we're talking about. Go ahead, Karim. And then um, Mary. The thing is, so I might have become very cynical about this, but um, actually, um, I love the word scam actually because scam really encompasses everything that we're talking about and I'm not I can't say I've seen I mean artists are more artists and like uh, cultural practitioners or whatever we call ourselves in general are more the um the the agents also of this perpetuation rather than uh people who might challenge it I mean um and I hope, I mean, uh, seeing all the presentations has uh, played a bit with my cynicism because all the actual projects we've seen seem amazing, uh, look amazing. But I've always been surprised in Palestine how the artists, even when they're extremely well intentioned, end up just perpetuating uh, these images that we already have. This includes um, like Palestinian artists or Palestinian writers, it includes me. Right? It's not only about other people, where we also commodify uh, these fantasies uh, of the places we are in. Um, and so I don't know if we can if we can actually like can we actually challenge this in a way that's significant? I, I'm actually not answering your question. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's okay. I, I, I get the part of cynicism. Um, I think I think part of the problem right here is that just like plays the conception of artists, it's also a control concept, right? So when you arrive to this place, as a real the preconceived ideas, not only of place but also of artistic intention, then you already have a formula for a bomb. <laughs> so I think. As one of the things that I've learned going to Archetopia all these years, decentering our practices ourselves from these myths that are contingent to all these historical processes, I think it's part of the I think it's part of the key. Very challenging, especially because for many places around the world, ego and artists don't seem to be separated um, at all. So, but that's that's the beauty of having the privilege to be able to be challenged in those ways. Mary, you wanted to say something? Your microphone, sorry. I you. think, okay. so anyway, uh, to, to just pick up on what you were saying, it, it is a problem and it's a problem that is sort of the human condition that we, we uh, grow up and we take in various things because where we grew up and where we took in th various things. And even the scientists will say that even if you prove something empirically, two researchers may come to two different conclusions even though they use the same proof. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's almost impossible, I think, because of this. But, uh, and the other thing is that time changes. You know, every day something, we're different every day, we have new cells. So we have to continuously confront this on a regular basis and slowly, 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 maybe some, I mean, it's my feeling that maybe some of the preconceived notions will drop away or we can hope they will drop away. But I think the main thing is to encourage people to, to uh, not be afraid of differences, but to be open and curious about them. 
And one of the things we do to confront this is obviously we try to send people places. We also try very hard, like for Hello World, there are places in the world we don't have really good Latin American representation yet. We always try, but so we um, wrote, and now we know Architopia. Um, we took, uh, I don't know if you know Trans Artists, we took Trans Artists website and we wrote every residency there and asked them to participate. You know, we try. So we try to, um, parts of the world that we don't know what's going on, try to get them involved in the dialogue. And another thing that we do is we don't uh, curate anything. For Hello World, anyone who submitted something was accepted because I have no idea what is culturally, you know, I'm not going to make decisions about this is better than that or that's better than this. So those are two ways that we've tried to address the problem, knowing that the problem is somewhat endemic. Right. Thank you so much, Sam, for oh, that. Pleasure. Lance, you want to say something? Hey, um, so how are you, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, coming from... Uh, very much the school of Francisco and Nayeli. We learn about corruptions, okay? So it, it becomes like those little moments, you know what I mean? Like literally from the arrival of the artist, me and my fullness, I show up. And so sometimes it's a coming in and sometimes it's a recoil, right? But it's just trying to get the artist to not only like take up like, oh, it's Vegas, so I want to talk about the strip. You know what I mean? Like from the beginning, from them being accepted, trying to like point them into the direction of the community that will take them almost further away from the strip, at least for us. And we're finding that in some ways kind of allows for the artist to actually uh, not just come with their uh, predisposed ideas. You know, it's kind of challenging them. You know, when an artist is saying, oh, I want someone, uh, I'm gonna source images, asking them about labor, little interruptions, like even in a meeting just saying, huh, it sounds as if someone else will be doing that labor for you and then just leaving it. You know what I mean? And then, and then right. you can proceed. And so again, it's like, it's little digs. You know what I mean? Like uh, all of us here can understand that sometimes it's those little, those little, those little cuts, death by a thousand cuts. You know what I mean? Like trying to kill, you know, get the thing to do what you needed to do. And I find that even with Ryan, that we, we make a space that allows for the artists to also come with, their preconceived things, but also we want them to come with like wherever they come from. So if the artist is from the South, we want them to lead with themselves and not what they think they're going to make in Vegas. Mm. That's really interesting. And it's very refreshing to hear both Ryan and Lance um, having, I spent my undergraduate in, in Las Vegas, but every institution, it almost seems like every institution it's created with this preconceived idea of Vegas' place to the mayor who introduces himself in public events with showgirls to, um, to museums that are created with the basis of the art criticism of this dangerous, dangerous man that is called Dave Hickey, right? Which is always about the allure of the desert in and in, in Vegas. So it's it's refreshing. <laughs> it's refreshing to see that now we have um, institutions that hopefully will um, will challenge those ideas. Rebecca. Uh, no, no, I, I think that's very true, and it's it's so interesting to think about the spaces that you inhabit and how you know. You know, if when this this landscape is already built up, um, and you know, we're these small organizations trying in some you know some tiny way, you know, to create alternatives and um, you know and other options and and other in, in other ways to imagine uh, you know what place and what community could look like. Um, and just going back to this, uh, there, there's a there's a Congolese um, historian that uh, I who wrote a book. Um, called uh, Silences in African History or Silences in African Discourse. Um, and he's, he, one of the, the quotes that sticks with me is he said, um, among those who have suffered enslavement, colonization, um, economic exploitation, et cetera, et cetera, um, silences should be seen as facts because silences are indeed facts that have not been accorded the status of facts. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, when we are... Uh, speaking with artists potential artists to come join us um you know we're interested in like are they listening to silences are they seeing gaps seeing absences um and interested in in interrogating those um you know and then and, and hopefully you know filling those spaces not with not filling them but 
that, but opening them up to 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 recognition and to acknowledgement. Yes, that's um, I think the foundation of of that philosophy comes from um, Haitian historian Rolf Trillo that talks about the the creation of 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 silences, and that's very that's very um, that's very important. Um, I I wanted to go to the idea of history. And that's the second question we posted in the beginning. So how is the history of place where you or your organizations are located intersecting with the challenges you face? And that goes even to a place like Vegas that sees himself themselves as having no history, yet the idea of the mafia, it's become, it was the first museum, <laughs> proper museum that we had in in, um, in Las Vegas. So I wondered if you can talk a little bit about that, Karim, you already mentioned this um, idea of history, but I wondered if you can elaborate a little bit more on, on that and we can, or anybody can, can, can speak of that. Do you want me to start? Mm -hmm. um, so the, the thing, the, the complicated thing about Palestine and specifically about Jericho where we're located is that, um, I mean, I don't know how to say this, but like we operate in a very old fashioned framework because like we're the, we're the last remaining um, early 20th century colony, right, of the world. Like literally, I think we're one of the last ones. So we're operating in a framework that's both like at the forefront of a lot of today's struggles, but also in a framework that is so old, that is so old and non-existent anymore in, in the way it existed like that. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's very strange. It's a place where you feel that like history is ongoing, but in the in this in the weirdest sense of history is ongoing, right? Like it's again like we're stuck in a in a strange type of past because the way obviously it's different because because we are today, but uh, the way Israel operates, at least ideologically, really looks like any old fashioned European, you know, colonial state. 19th century right like it's not that different um which also makes us weirdly um 19th century natives like it's, it's a very strange framework within which to operate um and i know that in the residency specifically one of the things so sorry before the residency um so the thing is one of the things that palestinians have to do constantly and it goes back to um what Rebecca was saying in her presentation is that we constantly have to prove that we exist. Like our basic action is to prove that we existed and that we exist as a legitimate people and as legitimate individuals. And obviously like doing that is essential because that's the basis of, the, uh, of how we're colonized, but also it distracts from everything else basically and from any sort of actual real political organization and resistance. And just to say that in the residency, one of the things that we try to do is that try to really situate, uh, our, we never tell artists what to do, but we try to guide them towards, um, I'm gonna say something that's contemporary or something that's contemporary in the sense that, it, that it's part of the present of the place in which they are and not necessarily of the past of the, of the place in which they are. And we try to do this like ongoing, like to create this ongoing presence-ness of, of the place where we are because we've been so distracted with our past and with doing archeologies span of our past to prove that we're here, that it was a great way to deny our existence in the presence. So we try to balance this. It's always, it's a huge challenge, but I think that's one of the main things we try to balance to answer this permanence of history within our current situation. Thank you so much. Um, yes, Ryan? Yeah, I mean, specific to Las Vegas um, and into what Lance was talking about with the actual casinos, I think it's so interesting um, that they're already through the lens of white supremacy. And then there's also the replicating, like making copies of these places for people to come visit. 
Um, and and your question also brought up. Um, you mentioned the the mafia, the mob museum mm -hmm. about the mafia, and also there's the the neon museum, um, which you know has the old signage. Um, and recently, um, I've been learning from a, a local artist who's been really active about calling the neon museum out on um, really problematic um, practices around um volunteers and staff that are people of color and also their response to um the current civil rights movement in the u.s so um there's there's so many interesting layers there to the um the the institutions that are presenting the the history of las vegas and then also the way that they're practicing within their um you know their hierarchy and their institution correct does anybody want to add to some of these ideas yes mary well uh one of the things that i think is problematic is place as a mental construct so that's just a problem right there because mm -hmm. mental constructs are hard for your brain to dislodge so you have to be confronted with something that makes you dislodge it people don't like to change very easily but also to bring up the idea that also places tied to often economic issues so mm -hmm. for instance you know montreal makes a big deal about being quebecois but being french as a way to bring people there because Otherwise, what do they have to offer? What they have to offer is French speaking, French culture, blah, blah, blah. you know, so we have to realize that also it's a, it's a very intertwined, difficult, it's very intertwined and very difficult to deal with these issues. But the thing is, of course, to try. Right. Rebecca and then Lance. Um, one thing that I think is in terms of modern discussions around the idea of place and space, uh, it's important to talk about and think about the, you know, the, con the concept and the ideology of, of the border. Um, and that the only, you know, like so many of these conversations, when we talk about, you know, where, where are, where the artists who come to our, pro who come to our residency are coming from, you know, we're talking about these national borders um, and to what, um, what, what Kareem was talking about, you know, about colonialism and, and uh, the current situation of Palestine, but so much of the way we think about um, the, the century and century before us is in terms of national borders. Um, but this itself is very much a, a, an imposed Western idea of like a border being a hard thing. Um, and there's uh, the historian Achille Mbembe is someone who I really enjoy reading. Um, in terms of his his, his um, reading of the history of the border in in Africa, and of course, um, a lot of times in in African history, uh, there's discussion of of tribal identity um, and the ways that colonial forces used tribal identities to pit groups of people against one another. Um, but what this reading often misses is that the way that a, a, a tribal identity was formed is not the same way that a national identity um, is formed. Um, Correct. And so, you know, in the the and and the idea of of an identity of a tribal identity over a border was always about its 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 inherent and necessary permeability and and um, and you know uh, flexibility and fluidity. Um, and so, when we think of you know a residency being this utopian concept that it you know you can use it to to try to fight against or dissolve um, borders uh, in a world that is so defined by an increasing insistence and demand that these borders be, res be respected, especially if you're talking about people who come from, um, you know, from places that are populated mostly by black and brown people, um, right. where you know it's only if this tiny portion of the world that is allowed the mo like this 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 dream of mobility. And so often, when uh, you know we're in conversations um, with uh, with artists about about movement, um, you know it's so restricted because of, of 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 the border and of the requirement of getting a visa. So you know, for so many European artists who come to Tanzania, all they have to do is get on a plane um, and and show up at the border, and and you know they. 
they're granted entry. Whereas for Tanzanian artists wanting to go anywhere else in the world, you know, it's this very dehumanizing process of, okay, show us what's in your bank account, fill out, you know, hundreds of pages of documents proving to us, proving that you somehow just deserve this basic right of, of movement. Right. Lance? Uh, beautiful points, Rebecca. Um, all your points, fantastic. But you, you to, I just brought borders in that, you know, when you think of even, again, to Ryan's point of literally flying into Las Vegas, it's, you know, going into a, uh, past the border of a place of, you know, where Kareem talks about needing to exist. Las Vegas is almost like you don't exist. You know what I mean? It's that place that you go to not exist, right? And then you brought up tribal identities. And I was like, duh, tribal identities of whiteness and the people that show up and flock to Las Vegas. Like, it's like, you know what I mean? Like, it's just really interesting to think of the way all these things like ping pong off of each other. And it's just, you know, trying to find a way. And that's, again, back to that point of trying to pull artists that come here literally a, a sort of away from the strip because there's an inherent danger there. You know what I mean? Because a lot of our artists are minorities and they are women. So honestly, you know, I oftentimes make strong provisions to protect them even from the idea of, you know, patriarchy. You know what I mean? So it's like all of these layers, you know what I mean? Like a uh, uh, place like Las Vegas that is literally meant for you to like not have inhibitions. You know what I mean? And to be able to be almost an invisible specter who can come in and, you know, do anything you need in this space and then leave. You know what I mean? And it goes back to the same ideas you all were talking about of people coming to spaces to kind of live in that fantasy. So, yeah. Yeah, and the idea of borders goes beyond national borders. I'm thinking here of Chicago, where to go to a gallery in the South Side or have a residency in the South Side, it's not the same thing as going to the North Side. They And the precon there's preconceived ideas of what kind of 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 residency or art show you're going to have in this um in this different this different spaces but so with that in mind i want to talk a little bit more about about that i think i had a question and then it it, <laughs> it went away Paco, you want to talk a little bit more about you? Do you want to um, give us your opinion about some of these ideas and surrounding the, the myth of these borders and how they function, especially in Mexico? Because I'm thinking the difference between Mexico City and Puebla, for instance, it's vastly, vastly different. Well, what is incredible is the the whole conversation that that you guys are having because we. We have been learning so much uh, from all of you in 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 the complicated, not complicated, complex connections that you all are making from monuments to sites to places to uh, you know this uh, whole conversation is incredible in terms of thinking about place in terms of thinking about um, the tradition of or, or the act of traveling and how do we. Uh, change that. So uh, more than anything, I, I, I'm, I'm so excited to learn from, to be learning from that process. And as Rebecca was saying in the beginning, how we found each other, because uh, it, it's a, it's an ongoing conversation that has been happening through every single panel, how these, uh, for a lack of a better term, as I keep saying, uh, topography as as Karim mentioned in, in in the first conversations that we had about this symposium it is incredible to think that first of all the similarities of empire and how nobody escapes empire how everyone is subject to exploitation and extermination in the end so even when you die it has to be profitable in every single sense and and also how these uh process of the images is is so complicated and and you know connecting with karim's idea of um trying to answer the question i was very cynical i am very cynical in that sense to to know that artists will make it worse artists will make things worse mm -hmm. but it's worth it it's worth it that's what i've learned in the process that it is really worth it because they invest so much in keeping their questions near and they invest their whole lives in trying to answer the question. So even if it makes it worse, 
it's it's incredible to be able to be part of that, not in an idealistic way, because as Lance was mentioning, the process has to be interrupted constantly. And therefore, the, the, the question becomes way more complicated. And as Sharon Holland explained in, in her lecture is our, our responsibility is to complicate the picture. How do we complicate the picture so that artists can find uh, some possibilities to answer their questions? which will never be answered, but at least it, it makes it more, um, it reinserts nuances that were lost, as, as, as you guys have mentioned in terms of the silences. Thinking about that, about interruptions and even pushing it forward to what happens after the residency, because we're talking about artists coming in into the residencies um, and historically speaking, travelers going into these places the fantasies they reenacted, the myths that they're going to create are going to be circulated to the printing culture, but sometimes it will take two, three, four, five, six years for those books to reach the hands of the readers. Now it's so much faster. <laughs> now it's with social media, those things, those violence are, are recreated by the second. So I wondered if there's anything within your organizations that you do, not to try to prevent, but to challenge the ideas that we're talking about beyond the time of the residency. So of course, once they go back, <laughs> it's, it's not your responsibility or not that it really is your responsibility when they're even there, but thinking about interruptions, have you, or did you, play with that idea after the residency um, is, is over. Lance? And then yeah, um, I, yeah I, think, I think so. Both me and Ryan make it a point to that um, almost aftercare, if you will, <laughs> you know what I mean, to check in with the artist, you know what I mean? Because, you know, it's, um, you know, that kind of that time away, even though for our space, you know, it's you know, meditative, all residents have that meditative space. For me uh, to try and ensure, I just try and check in. That's basically what I try and do, check in with the artists a little and kind of see where they are uh, and how they're feeling about you know, the work that they made, the things that they didn't get to do. You know what I mean? Try and keep up, again, that community. That's what I'm trying to do. It's like, so it's like you're here for a couple weeks to two months and then you leave. And there may have been a few people that you didn't get to, get to connect to. So just keeping up that community and just checking in, I think. Yeah. Mary? Um, well, like Laz was saying, we do check in. We, have, we usually survey our artists afterwards. We also keep them involved. And they actually, we don't have to keep them involved too much because once they meet someone else, they start doing things. So, uh, but we keep inviting them to anyone who's ever done anything with us, we invite them again and again and again. I wanted to go back to this idea about borders because, um, I mean, I think one of the great things about the symposium is that it offers a solution to borders. And one of the great things about living today is our solutions to borders. For instance, we could not bring an artist from Lebanon who does this wonderful project with language because he's Lebanese and the right age and the government, you know, we had, we didn't have visa problems. He had visa problems before when he was coming and we got, so he couldn't come. So I thought, tough. We're Skyping him in. No one's going to keep someone's voice from being here. Mm -hmm. So we have lots of ways, I think that, and I, and I really thank you for the symposium because I think this is one thing that gives us a little bit of hope that we can, even if we, even if we can't be there physically, we can start the dialogue, we can try, we can do what we can, which is you know, wonderful what everyone is doing. Anybody else wants to um, go ahead, Ryan? Yeah, I just wanted to add one other thing in terms of engaging with previous um, resident artists. We also um, have asked um, alumni to be part of the, the panel review process. So then their voice is continued in choosing who like the, the next generation is. Just want to add that. Mm -hmm. Karim? Um, yeah, I was, I was gonna say something similar. The, the, one of the things that El Atlal, throughout the years we noticed worked was um, inviting the same residents back again. Uh, because usually the first time around, Again, regardless of how 
knowledgeable they are, how well-intentioned they are, how whatever they are, they're, they're learning. They're in a place that is so foreign and strange and, I mean, you have to say it, like exotic to them that they're going to stumble and fall and say all sorts of stupid bullshit. And like, you know, and <laughs> but at least they, they have this, I'm going to use that word, but this first encounter with the land. And when they come back, usually that's when like stuff starts to happen, like stuff coalesces at that point. And, and we were recently talking, so we don't know, this year is COVID, this year is COVID, so we won't have residency, but, but we're like, oh, we need to invite the same people back again and again and again, because this is how you build something that's long lasting in the place you're in and with these artists. And this is how you do something for us, at least that felt really um, meaningful. Rebecca, do you want to add anything to, to that? Um, sure. I mean, I, I think I would say, you know, um, it's, it's important to think uh, in terms of, like, I think the emphasizing the collective, um, you know, uh, and relationships over, like, identities and individuals. Mm -hmm. um, and yes. so Nefas itself as an organization is also just an experiment in this kind of attempts at um, you know, uh, kind of a de, de hierarchy or unhierarchy to use the, the un, you know, the unformation. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I think there's so much self critique and self criticism that's very important in this kind of work. Um, because it's always so easy to replicate, um, you know, the systems that are around you. you know, it's just like the water uh, around the fish that you don't, that doesn't know that it's, that it's there. Um, and so I think using that kind of constant questioning of ourselves and reflecting and, um, experimenting and trying things, um, over and, and seeking out feedback and difficult discussions, difficult, um, difficult conversations where they're necessary, um, is, is really important. Thank you, Rebecca. Francisco Nayeli, do you want to add anything else about this idea of challenging, interrupting? Okay, I think um, I want to just one last time open the floor. If anybody has final comments or if there's something that we haven't touched upon that we would like to speak about or just um, concluding remarks. Yes, Ryan? I just want to say thank you. Um, I have learned so much both in creating um, this uh, presentation with Lance and then obviously by listening to all of you and um, I'm really grateful for that and I know I'm going to be thinking about this conversation for the next few weeks so I appreciate you all. <laughs> Thank you Ryan. Anybody else? Mary? I just, of course, want to say thank you because it's really wonderful that now I have met more people. It's really wonderful. Thank you. And the, I th it's really been interesting topics and um, it opened my eyes to many places that I don't know about. For instance, I don't know that much about Tanzania or Palestine and I'm really, and Las Vegas, I know a little bit about, but not so much. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Yeah, oh, go ahead, Karim, and then Lance. Oh, yeah, I, I really enjoyed this conversation, and I'm really looking forward. I think, as Ryan said, like I think I'm going to think about it for a while because I learned a lot, and I'm looking forward to seeing what's going to come out of all of this. So thank you very much, and thanks, Emmanuel, for moderating. Thank you. Lance? Hey. Um, no, I just wanted to say the same. Thanks. Um, the level of understanding, the level of investigation uh, that just this panel has really like pushed you know, myself and Ryan. Uh, I'm just so thankful, you know. And I think these conversations are great because they have a place to be. Uh, you know, you know, we can come to them again. We can revisit. I was talking to Francisco. I was like, some of these conversations. They should be put in schools, you know what I mean? Like, so people can start to understand before you even get out, you know, being an artist, you know, you can still start to learn these things. So maybe we can help a little to build up artists that are more aware, you know, of the, you know, the, the, the frameworks, you know, and be more mindful. Yeah. 
Thank you, Lance. Likewise, thank you so much to all of you. Emmanuel, you've done such an incredible job of tying together all of the presentations and asking questions that just, uh, you know, align everything and, and create these connections. And uh, friend, um, yeah, Francisco Nayeli, this has been such a great uh, experience. And I think also the, the fact that we can go back to these recorded conversations again and again as a resource um, and as a guide for the work um, that we continue to do will be wonderful. And it's just given a chance to really reflect um, and share and exchange. And, uh, and that's what these, our programs are all about. So thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. I just wanted to conclude with just tying a lot of this. Oh, go ahead, Francisco, sorry. Yes, be, before the, the last conclusion, we also want to mention that by the end of the, towards the end of the mm -hmm. symposium, we are organizing a special session uh, to rethink how we relate to each other as programs, as residencies, as organizations in general, even as scholars. And, and the theme that we are going to be exploring, and, and it's an open-ended question more than any of, of the other panels, is to uh, rethink the economies uh, and, and the idea of alternative economies. So Nayeli has uh, some information to provide in terms of, of how it's uh, organized and what are the ideas that we have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so first of all, thank you, everyone. This has been great. Thank you, Emmanuel, for all these years being our ally. That, that's part of our mission. And especially what we want to explore in the last session that it's called Take Your Love, it's how Archetopia can expand uh, the community, but also connect with other uh, allies, with other institutions. So by the end of the symposium, I will be contacting contacting each of the organization to see how we can expand this dialogue and how we can start working all together uh, in this idea of community and uh, econo alternative economies. Thank you, thank you. Um... Thank you, Nayeli. Thank you, uh, Francisco. And I just wanted to sort of wrap up some of the ideas because I feel like we should all write them down. And each one of the ideas that they were brought up feels like it could be its own symposium. So first, Karim talked about the allure of landscape and the, uh, and the desert. And that's something that it's been part of the conversations here um, in the symposium, how to landscape. Um, functions or what does it do to the creation of, of place? The challenges of expected versus the experienced place and how that shapes also our ideas of the spaces that we visit. The picturesque, the picturesque, it's something that I think also could be its own, its own, um, its own table, its own <laughs> symposium because um, we're talking about today with artist residencies, but this sort this idea of the grand tour, this idea of the picturesque, has been in construction for thousands, for thousands of of, of years. What I think it was the biggest lesson for me was the different levels in which place is produced. It's not just here, it's not just our ideas about what we're going to, um, what we expect and what we're going to experience. But it's how material culture participate on that, how the built environment participates in that, what kind of monuments are, are constructed around some of these ideas. And thinking of all of that in mind, that creates and poses new challenges as to how do we conduct our residency spaces. Thank you, Rebecca, Mary, Lance, Ryan, Karim, um, Francisco and Nayeli for this incredible, um, this incredible panel. I feel very happy. And also I got all these ideas for the paper that I'm that I'm working on. So you just got a little bit of a taste. And 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 I'm very happy. And thank you, thank you, thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful, thank wonderful you. day. Thank you. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. Thank you.